Hello, welcome to episode number 544 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. Welcome to a very special birthday episode of my podcast. And in honor of my birthday, which was Wednesday of this week, I've got two very special episodes lined up for the next two weeks. And in this first one, we're headed to space. That's right. My guest is Mana Atara from Posit Science, and we're talking about brain training for astronauts. Mana and I explore the details of a new pilot study called Icarus, or Increasing Cognitive Ability Reserve Using Software. The details of the Brain HQ app at the heart of this study, the promising results that this study showed for long-distance space travel, and some of the other super cool studies that Posit Science is working on. Also this week, I check out a new way for astronauts to easily quench their thirst on the moon. Spoiler alert, it involves a microwave. (laughs) But first, let's talk about brain training for astronauts with Mana Atara. Hi, Dr. Atara. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me today. It's wonderful to be here and to chat with you this morning. Excellent. Okay, so we're talking about a new study conducted by NASA that examined the benefits that computerized brain training could have for astronauts during long-distance space travel. But Dr. Atara, before we get into the details of the study, let's talk a bit about the adverse effects that space travel has on the brain. You know, that's an excellent question. What we know is that our brains change based on our environment. The brain has billions of neurons. These are, of course, cells that transmit information. And the bodies of those cells form what's called gray matter. And the tails of those cells form what's called white matter. And we know that the volumes of both actually get altered due to the gravitational forces from being up in space. So important brain tissue is being affected by space exploration, which isn't good. We also know that social engagement and novelty and stimulation is very important for brain health, but traveling to Mars, for example, can take a while, right? Up to 10 10 months or so. So that's a very, very long time to be socially isolated without the normal cognitive stimulation a person normally gets from being on Earth, right? On Earth, we can explore a new hiking trail. We can go out with friends and visit new restaurants. We can pick up new hobbies whenever we please. But we can't quite do too much of that up in space. So what's so striking about the effects of space travel is that we see these very kinds of changes in aging populations as well. You know, they too show changes in brain tissue. And we know that being socially isolated accelerates brain aging. So even though astronauts are very healthy individuals with very healthy brains, NASA is really ahead of the curve in understanding that space travel is essentially a major environmental assault on the brain. So they're rightfully thinking of these core issues and looking to identify tools that astronauts can use to strengthen their brain in this ongoing way so that they can stay in peak performance throughout their mission. All right. So let's talk about this pilot study. So tell me about the exercises included. And these exercises were from Posit Science's Brain HQ app, right? That's right. Posit Science's Brain HQ app. Over the past few decades, our understanding of how the brain works has changed pretty significantly. The prevailing view historically was that the brain was hardwired. You know, there was nothing you could do to improve your brain health beyond those critical periods in very early childhood. And as you aged, it was only natural for all parts of the system, the wiring and the plumbing, for all of that to degrade and just stop working. But now what we know is that the adult brain is highly plastic. For example, it can adapt, it can reorganize itself, it can drive these structural functional chemical changes throughout your life based on what you learn and whatever you experience. 
So after spending several decades improving the brains of animals like rats and mice and monkeys throughout their lives, you know, our co-founder, Dr. Michael Merzenich, he's a world-renowned neuroscientist from UCSF. He took those 30 years of findings in neuroscience and decided, hey, you know, isn't it time to improve the brains of humans? So we built Brain HQ. We tested it in human studies to confirm it worked. And the program is simply an online training app. It's available on a web, iOS, and Android, and it's easy to access uh, anywhere with an internet connection. And it works really to improve the speed and accuracy of what you see in here. So, of course, NASA was one of those recent groups that picked up Brain HQ to use in their initial pilot study of whether you can change the brains of young folks who were already high performers. And so they selected the set of exercises that would be most relevant to an astronaut population. There are exercises for training how fast your brain processes information, how much information you can track in a glance, how to suppress distraction in pursuit of a goal, how much stuff you can hold in your memory and how quickly you can make a decision. And all of these cognitive functions are really central to having a successful mission. That is super cool. So let's talk about the results. Now, the addition of these kind of brain training exercises could be crucial for long-term space travel, right? That's right. So everyone participating in the study had their cognition evaluated using something called the NASA Cognition Test Battery. It was developed for astronauts and it assesses things like, you know, your brain speed, your memory, your intelligence, your decision-making, And then they give them 18 hours of Brain HQ over a six-week period. And then once folks finished their training, they got the NASA Cognition Battery again to see if their performance changed. And what they found was this huge improvement on the training exercises, you know, which we would expect people improved on what they trained on. Although I will say that this group of people in particular showed a pretty remarkable increase in scores. Um, But what was really exciting to us and to NASA is that they also, the participants got better on the NASA cognition battery, which shows that their training generalized to tasks that they didn't train on directly. So these findings essentially serve as the foundation for using Brain HQ in the future Artemis crew. That is super cool. So this pilot study is just one part of Brain HQ, right? What other kinds of studies are you guys involved in? Yeah, that's exactly right. So our company has very deep roots in the science. We've been very committed to collecting efficacy data, very committed to working with, you know, many, many independent researchers around the world to test the software in their own labs and have them draw their own conclusions. You know, there are actually more than 200 published studies using the program at this point in time with more than 300 currently underway. Much of the work on brain training to date has been devoted to older adults or folks with a specific condition. So, for example, people diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment, or maybe they're diagnosed with schizophrenia, or maybe they're diagnosed with ADHD. But in recent years, we've had the great privilege to work with a number of groups such as, you know, the United States Special Operations Command, the National Guard, the Italian Army, the Coast Guard. We've worked with Tom Brady's TB12 program, Major League Baseball, and now NASA. And the goal of these projects has really been to give individuals with already high performance abilities a competitive edge. But the underappreciated aspects is that training can help shield against the effects of a risky environment. So really any occupation where the environment poses a threat to your brain health, you know, maybe through the risk of concussions or through chemical exposures or, you know, prolonged social isolation or any medical condition that affects how your brain functions really is an opportunity to use computerized brain training. I love it. This was super cool. Thank you so much for joining me. But before I let you go, it's time for your off the cuff. Are you ready? I'm ready. (laughs) Okay. So (laughs) if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you need a passport to get there or the restaurant is closed. (laughs) What would you have? One meal. Can it be a dessert? For sure. Okay, so I live in California, 
And one of my favorite desserts is in Chicago. I believe it's in um, downtown in a little French market and it's called raw and they make, I'm not, I am not vegan, you know, in my day to day, but they make the best vegan tiramisu I've ever had. And so I absolutely, it's made with um, cashews and almonds and dates, and it actually tastes better than the real thing, in my opinion. So I think that is my all-time favorite dessert. Excellent. I am there next time I have to go to Chicago. (laughs) (laughs) Well, this has been super cool. Thank you so much for joining me. You know, thanks for inviting me, Amelia. It was a pleasure to talk with you. Let's talk about water on the moon. For the past 10 years or so, there has been more and more evidence of water on the moon. But unfortunately for us, it's trapped between the grains of surface lunar dust called regolith. The highest concentrations do seem to be around the poles, where direct sunlight never reaches the moon. So, how do we release that trapped water from its lunar regolith shackles? with a microwave. That's how. (laughs) And a team of scientists from the University of Central Florida and the Open University have done it. So this is how it was done. They started with two different types of simulated regolith based on samples from the Apollo missions. One type of simulated regolith mimicked the soils of the Mare Plains, while the other was similar to the Lunar Highlands. From there, they mixed these two simulated soils with deionized water so that the samples made up somewhere between 3% and 15% of the weight of each sample. Now, those ranges are conservative, but they are based on direct evidence from regolith from the lunar polar regions. From there, the samples were put into ceramic paper lined crucibles and then placed into a chamber that mimicked the temperature and pressure of the surface of the moon. And then it was heated at 250 watts for 25 minutes. And guess what? It worked. They were able to extract 67% of the Highlands regolith and 50% of the Mare samples. And even better, When the samples were heated for 35 minutes, 90% of the water was extracted. And the best part is that this team says that astronauts could extract water using these low-powered microwaves in areas that have relatively little water, under 10% by weight. Wow. So, if you'd like even more information about this regolith story or to find more information about Brain HQ, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page on eejournal.com and in the YouTube description for this week's episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, sure, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. (laughs) And you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Podbean. And remember, if you'd like to further support this podcast, leave me a review on that podcasting platform of your choice. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or, heck, you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on eejournal. 
for the week of August 11th, 2023. I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.